Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're starting today a new series entitled The Seasons of Life. Now that's something that we're all involved in, isn't it? And this per first lesson is entitled The Rhythms of Life. It's lesson one for April 6th of 2019. We're going to have a lot of questions in this series of lessons, I can warn you, and we'll see how we can deal with all these questions. But let's, as, as usual, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing the challenges that each one of us face as we move through the stages of life and the wonderful opportunity we have to seek your guidance in each of those stages. May we learn something about that this evening that will help each one of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't have to tell anyone here or anyone listening out there that in life we face a lot of choices. Um, everything in our life, it seems like, is involved with choices in one way or another. But then again, changes come. And would we ever, would we want to live a life without changes? I hope not. It would become very boring. Uh, changes can be, bring excitement. They can bring joy. Um, wait till you see a new grandson, huh, Gordon? I did that last week. Yeah, pretty exciting. Those are changes. Well, we're, we want you to think about what major changes might have come in your life in the last week or year, a few months. How have those changes impacted you? Were you prepared for those changes or did they come unexpectedly? Um, so let's go back to the beginning of the story of our world and look at, for example, Genesis 1-1. See what we can locate here. I can get my machine to work like it's supposed to. There we go. In the beginning, when God created the universe, in the beginning, when God created the universe, that's a little different than what we're used to, isn't it? Well, it goes on to say, the earth was formless and desolate, the raging oceans were covered, ev covered everything, was engulfed in total darkness, and the Spirit of God was moving over the water. So, it sounds like when God came here, or came here to create our world, there was already something here. Um, is that true? I well, if we're pretty logical. Yeah. If we are to correctly understand what happened there, it seems that God took a rocky ball covered with water, or at least mostly covered with water, and transformed it into a beautiful Garden of Eden. But, God did, uh, but did God create the ball of stone with its molten center at the same time he created our world? With, uh, the next text does not seem to suggest that. In the original languages, we need to understand this, uh, earth, the word earth means the rock and the core materials that form our globe. World, by the way, in Greek, that would be cosmos. And when we talk about a cosmetologist, what does a cosmetologist do? Puts it into order. Okay, and? Tries to make it look better. Yeah. So it, it deals with what's covering on the outside. So, and that's what, the, that's what world means. It means the covering of our earth. Um, the Bible does not tell us if the earth was created at the same time as the world. Yes, Jim. Uh, verse 18 of Isaiah 45. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, who formed the earth and made it, he established it, he did not create it a chaos, he formed it to be inhabited. Mm -hmm. Anyways, oh, notice that in, in relationship. Yeah. Well, there's no question, at least no question in my mind, that God created everything in the beginning. The question we're just asking here, and it's not one we're going to dwell on, is there may have, God may have created our earth with whatever's in, inside of it at one point, and then sometime later came back and made it into that beautiful world that Adam and Eve uh, were able to live on. There's translations that uh, give you that impression, and which gives you, it, it goes like this, Genesis 1, 1, in beginning he created Elohim, the heavens and the earth, verse 2, and it, it became a chaos. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a place for the war in heaven, Revelation 12. 
uh, prior to, uh, with the general reading, you don't know where to put the war in heaven. Yeah, well, one thing is certain that everything, life, the earth, whatever you want to name, at one time or another was created by God. Yeah, Carl. Uh, I don't quite remember the text, but probably Genesis 1, 2, 3, somewhere, I kind of feels like the Lord created the universe and uh, and perhaps the solar system he created and he made the earth have sun and Venus no first the next one mercury mm -hmm. oh. mercury and then the earth and placed it in a very unique position yeah. the earth okay exactly. so but then of course who knows time went by and there was a problem in heaven mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'll let you go, but I'm going to let you go here only, and I'm going to create. It's kind of, I get that idea that maybe that's what had happened. We don't know. Okay, fine, 6,000 yeah. years ago, all right, you, whenever he did re rebel, so you let come me, here. Let so. me support your, your, your content, your idea there. Look at Revelation 12. Uh, it must be verse 7 or 8. Let's have a look at that really quick. Um, there was more. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil of Satan, de that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. It doesn't say thrown down to the world, thrown down to earth. And we know that when Adam and Eve were created, who was already there? Lucifer. What's that? So that implies that there was earth here, that Satan in his a ball of Bach or whatever it is, that might have been here, that Satan was cast down to uh, before... Anyway, that's... Uh, then they, they made a mess of it, and that would be a part of the war in, in heaven or in the heavens. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, God, my understanding is God is a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, an educator. He doesn't force through intimidation and so forth, coercion. He educates. And the Revelation was 12.4, it was the, the third of the stars, mm -hmm. uh, the third of the heavenly intelligences. And you get to Genesis 1, the in uh, Elohim did this. Elohim did that. And finally, and if you look at it, uh, enough references, Elohim is all God's creation, uh, all intelligent creatures, which would include us. Mm -hmm. And you've been too far out. Uh, he, he says, "Okay, I'm going to teach you." And the, and he says, "What do you think?" Well, okay, uh, let, let, let's make man in our image, not God talking to himself. It's it, it does it, as a teacher. Let's so. Well, uh, look at the wild extremes that are popular in our world today. Evolution claims that given enough time, almost anything can happen by chance. That complex life forms have developed from many small DNA changes over thousands or even millions of years. The laws of thermodynamics suggest just the opposite. That is, that given enough time, everything on planet Earth will deteriorate into chaos. So what are those laws of thermodynamics, Kerry? The first law, also known as the law of conservation of energy, states that energy cannot be created or destroyed in an isolated system. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of any isolated system always increases. The third law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of a system <coughs> approaches a constant value as the temperature approaches absolute zero. Now, I, I didn't put this in our handout, but uh, someone else tried to say this in more understandable terms. He said, the first law says you get what you pay for. <laughs> the second law says you can't even break even. And the third law says you'll lose it all in the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> that's about right. That's about, so that's, a, that's, where, that's where the evolutionists are, okay? So Ellen White suggests something quite different. Charles, you want to help us yes. with that? Order is heaven's first law. And the Lord desires his people to give in their own homes a representation of the order and harmony that pervade the heavenly courts. Truth never places her delicate feet in a path of unfeelingness or impurity. Truth does not make men and women coarse or rough or untidy. It raises all who accept it to a high level. Under Christ's influence, a work of constant refinement 
goes on. Wow. Yes, this is beautiful, beautiful. But heaven's first law is obedience in all things. Mm. By creation and by redemption, we are God's property and we are to submit to the working of His Holy Spirit, cooperating with it, but not attempting to work it ourselves. Under its guidance, we are made contrite in heart. Our souls are not lifted up in vanity, but are humbled before God. Okay, a couple of passages there, from one from Review on Herald in 1902 and one from Signs of the Times in 1897. Uh, interesting statements from Ellen White. So what do you think is the relationship between order and obedience? Well, if you understand obedience as a willingness to listen or take instruction, that implies that there's teaching going on. Mm -hmm. Just to obey th th because of a command or something like that is uh, d not a lot of freedom there. Not, not, or not real orderly, is it? No. So. Uh, the Lord has given us enough evidence to obey. That reminds me of that famous quotation of Steps to Christ, page 105. He not, does not ask us to believe anything without giving sufficient, adequate evidence. Yeah. And that's enough in my life now. Certain things, well, we'll talk. But, yeah. you know, certain things, uh, well, I, I don't think we should speculate and spend time on. Has He given us enough e evidence in this Bible to trust? Trust! Or did even obey? Trust in Him. Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes. Yeah. Well, even after the flood, now some people might, a lot of people in our world today question the, the, that the, there ever was a flood, but even after the flood, we find that the seasons continued, the day and night continued, a lot of orderliness was there, even despite that huge disruption. Um, Isaiah 66, 23 seems to suggest that when we get to heaven, we'll still be celebrating months and Sabbaths. So there's order in God's universe everywhere. Well, what will we be celebrating at the new moon festivals in heaven? Some have suggested that it will be the time for a new monthly fruit to ripen on the fruit tree of life. Could that be true, Gordon? The Jewish New Moon Festival is described as Rosh Kodesh, or Rosh Hodesh, I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciation, translated beginning of the month or literally ahead of the month. And that is the name for the first day of every month in the Hebrew calendar marked by the birth of a new moon. It is considered a minor holiday akin to the intermediate days of Passover and Sukkot, another word I'm probably slaughtering, mm -hmm. this from uh, Wikipedia. Okay, so how does the Sabbath impact your life? Are there any disadvantages of the Sabbath? Um, some people say, well, I can't make money on that day. Well, no, I guess not. <laughs> Is that a disadvantage? But there, what kind of advantages are there? What are some of the things which come to your mind immediately? What are the advantages of the Sabbath? Time for fellowship. Time for fellowship. <clears throat> Time for family. Needed rest. Time for needed rest. If I may share, after years, years of Adventist education, I landed in a Catholic school for four years. And sometimes we'd get locked up, you know, and then after Sabbath, take the exams. And our classmates, our, our professors wondered why. I had Jewish friends. This is Sabbath. You, you, are a, you are a heathen. You're a pagan. Sabbath is ours. And you are the one who is keeping it and you are blessed when you come back to school uh, uh, on Monday and here we go and do wild stuff. But, you know, I mean, that's for the first time ever, Sabbath found its real beauty in my life. I mean, the crazy exams coming up on Monday, it didn't matter. I'd, I'd, I'd rush up the, uh, this huge building and go and see the sunset in the Bay of Manila Bay, you know, and it's just, Lord, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. And ever since then, Sabbath has been a delight to me. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly the Sabbath was designed to give us an opportunity to remember God. Yes. That's for sure, our Creator and our Savior. And we, a lot of us need it every week. <laughs> Probably all of us. 
Well, what we find in modern day is that clocks seem to regulate everything. They tell people when to get up, when to work, when to play, when to go to sleep, when to... I mean, we are so dominated, we expect the people to be on time, within the minute, when there's an appointment. Um, well, it turns out that our bodies also have clocks in them, a natural clock inside of our brains that tells us when we are hungry, when we are supposed to sleep, when we are supposed to wake up, unless, of course, your life is, gone, is controlled by an alarm clock. So these, involve, these rhythms involve changes in our body's chemistry, our nervous system, and metabolism. They're called circadian rhythms, developed for what we normally do each day. The brain just gradually says, okay, I can see that at this time we normally do this, so let's get ready. At this time we normally do this, so let's get ready. And so it prepares. Surely we would recognize that uh, in our lives there's a time for birth, death, planting, pulling up, growing, weaning, giving birth, youth, marrying, ripe old age, dying, being buried, just a few of the things that David and Solomon talked about in their books. David said well, our lives are normally supposed to be about how long? Seventy. Seventy, 70 years. And if you're lucky, eighty, he says. Those, those years might be filled with trouble and sorrow, or they might seem like life would soon be over. So between the bookends, and the bookends would be birth and death, we go through a lot of changes. Some are major changes, some relatively minor. All are based on our good or bad choices as we go. Well, we should rejoice in these facts, because it would be very boring if we were all exactly the same. Um, it's true that we came from a single ancestor, However, we have developed into different races, languages, cultures, and habits. And how can we do a better job of appreciating and even celebrating our differences instead of letting them divide us? Here in the United States, we seem to be trying to discuss the differences between men and women. There are a lot of women now who think that they can do a better job at government. I hope they can. We've been doing a pretty bad job recently, the men, so we'll find out. Well, can we con consciously make the choice of being a blessing to all around us? And how would we do that? Well, I could... talking of Sabbath, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> it doesn't mention wives resting on the Sabbath. <laughs> Now, hold on. I know, but raising a family and the Sabbath, you had to start on the first day of the week and plan all the way so that Sabbath could be the very best day from sundown Friday to sundown. And it was. It was truly the biggest blessing for all of us. Mm -hmm. But it took a lot of organizing and work to make those hours Especially okay, now I, I want to add something to your comment right there. The, the good Lord says that each day begins when? In the evening as the sun goes At down. At sundown. Okay, I think that was especially for women. I'll tell you why. There's a lot of women, I don't know how it was in ancient times, but a lot of women in our day, if, the sun, if, if Sabbath began early in the morning, on Sabbath morning, or even at midnight or Friday night, there would be a lot of women who would be working their tails off up until the time the, the bell rang, or whatever you want to call it, the moment when so forth, and they would wake up on Sabbath morning, and, oh, man. So I am very glad that the Lord said, no, it has to end at sundown. I mean, it has to, the day ends at sundown, the new day starts at sundown, so that the family can be together, enjoy the evening together, get a good night's rest, and celebrate the next day for Sabbath. So I think that was especially for women. Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems Not to say there aren't special blessings for everyone. Sure, But exactly. it is a lot of, and Sabbath schools, all these women that plan the Sabbath school lessons for the children, mm -hmm. you know, and our pastors. Mm -hmm. it, so there's a lot of intent that goes into making Sabbath special yep, for definitely. the whole congregation. Sure. Yeah. I think you can take it on a broader scale, though. We've got neighbors. Just your demeanor and what you do, and they'll ask you, where, where, where are you going? I've been asked that once or twice. Mm -hmm. And you get, you, you get, 
take advantage of a little mini health talk. I gave an immediate neighbor that he drinks too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw a side view of him recently and I thought, oh man. But people don't know these kind of things and you can talk about that on the Sabbath or mm -hmm. even during the week. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, one of the things that we're going to really focus on in the next few lessons at least is that God is love. We know about that from 1 John 4, 8, and 16. Let's just uh, read that in case you haven't read it recently. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if we drop down to verse 16, we read, and, who, and we ourselves know and believe that love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in, un in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. So twice in one chapter, we have that very blunt statement, God is love. Love means that we care about others and are willing to give them priority over ourselves. This is one of the major themes of Christianity. Love is one of the major, probably it's the, it's the one word that's most associated with Christianity, I would say, love. So a motto that some Christians have adopted is calling living life, living a life of joy. Jesus first, others next, and yourself last. Why is that so difficult for ordinarily, ordinarily selfish human beings? We all have lots of insights about that all of a sudden. How do we get to be selfish? It's pretty natural. Pretty Born, natural. That way. Born that way. Yeah. Born that way. I think we probably did. For most of us, it probably takes a lot of practice as we grow up. I have a I have a, a shocking statement that um, in the Bible where it talks about submission and authority, one of the things that has caused myself personal growth is being in submission to my husband. Mm -hmm. That has been a, a wonderful journey for me. Mm -hmm. And that does not come easily. And if that relationship yep. were not there, I would be very rebellious in my heart, and I don't know how I would be able to submit to God, mm -hmm. because Dennis is closer, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so it's more real to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I think your, your thing is on oh. Your microphone? Oh, I thought you were just waving. Oh. Oh. No. Okay. Well. okay, you know what, I wrapped this thing around it. Okay. Well, we know the story of Job, but let me just read a few verses to get to our next point in the lesson. Job 1, 13 to 19. One day when Job's children were having a feast at the home of their eldest brother, a messenger came running to Job. We were plowing the fields with the oxen, he said, and the donkeys were in a nearby pasture. Suddenly the Sabaeans attacked and stole them all. They killed every one of your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, Three bands of Chaldean raiders attacked us and took away the camels and killed all your servants except me. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Before he had finished speaking, another servant came and said, your children were having a feast at the home of your eldest son when a storm swept in from the desert and blew the house down and killed them all. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up and tore his clothes in grief. Can you imagine? Can you even imagine what that must have been like? And then the next chapter, chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Then Satan left the Lord's presence. This is after he gets permission from God to torture Job, the Satan left the Lord's presence and made sores break out all over Job's body. Job went and sat by the rubbish heap, took a piece of po broken pottery to scrape his sores. His wife said to him, why are you are still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you curse God and die? Didn't sound like she was being very helpful to Job right at that moment, huh? Well, can you imagine anything worse happening to you than what happened to Job? Did he have any idea? Do you think Job had any idea at all when that started happening to him that he was a centerpiece in the great controversy? 
No. Wow. Did Job know that Satan was causing all his troubles and that God had allowed it? Well, it's very interesting this to notice that God says at the beginning, what does God say about God at the very beginning? Don't take his life, but you can do everything. Yeah, else. but even before okay. that, he said, Job is a... Righteous, righteous and upright man. Righteous and upright man. And then when he got to the end, after all those people came with their crazy accusations against Job and so forth, Job 42, 7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. If only the children of Israel had learned that lesson, what, what Job was all about. You know, we've... The Bible study guide has dealt with this book of Job at least three times over the last 30 years mm -hmm. and have never properly addressed what those lies were. Yeah. And if you go through, like I did some uh, months ago, you can shrink it all down. The lies told by the friends of Job were God punishes and God destroys. Mm -hmm. that, it's that simple. And yet you've got all, because they, they say a lot of good things, but the bottom line is God punishes and God destroys. God declared Job a righteous and upright man. Now those people that have a prop, problem with, um, called process theology, they think people are not free if God knows the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a serious problem that they have. But... Uh, <laughs> What finite being in time and space can l dictate what the limits are of the infinite one? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, God does not punish. God does not destroy. God permits things to happen. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. And, and, but it's true, and, and I'll add one more step there. God takes responsibility. Even if he, even if he doesn't he does. cause it, he takes responsibility. He does. So, yeah, quickly. Um, to me, it appears that the Lord, our Heavenly Father, put Himself on trial directly in mm -hmm. two places um, at the cross mm -hmm. and Job. I mean, it told the entire universe, look, I trust Him and He will not fail me. Yeah, amazing. Amazing, amazing. So, Job, think about it. Job lost his property, he lost his labor force, he lost his children, he lost his health, he lost the support of his life and he lost the encouragement of his friends. Why would God allow that kind of thing to happen to someone? It's a part of the great controversy. To show Job's, what Job was really like. Yeah. Job was one of the first books of the Bible to be written. Now, if only our Jewish people friends had read and understood the book of Job and the false accusations that his friends brought against him, many of their problems down through the generations might have been avoided. There's a, even in ancient Jewish writings, uh, they suggest that Job was written by Moses. And what does Ellen White say, Jim? The long years amid desert solitudes were not lost. Not only was Moses gaining a preparation for the great work before him, but during, but during this time, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote the book of Genesis and also the book of Job, which would be read with deepest interest by the people of God until the close of time. Wow, very interesting. Question for you. What do you think Job's second family will say to Job's first family when they get to heaven? Never thought about that? Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. You think the first family will have any complaints against God? Well, Job was concerned about what, what this first family was doing, wasn't he? So, we don't know. What, what, you know we, all we can do is have sanctified speculation. <laughs> do you I think, be, yeah, go ahead. I believe every Sabbath, the Lord says, Hey, Job, come over. Mm -hmm. Tell this folk, tell everyone, the part of the great controversy. Yeah. It's going to be beautiful. It's mm -hmm. going to be beautiful. The first side, the second, they come together. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's going to be beautiful. 
do you think, bored. Do you think Abel had any idea what was going to happen when he followed his brother out into the fields? Mm. No. We'd never seen death, so yeah. how, how was he going to... Well, take that back. They'd had sacrifices already part of that, hadn't yeah. they? Yeah. So, yeah. Mm, that's... Joseph, it's, 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 it, that probably wasn't Cain's first outburst. No, it no. wasn't. Lead up to that yeah. I suspect that there had been some others before leading up yeah. to that. See, to me, that is much worse than what happened to Job. Uh -huh. Because it's his own brother. Mm -hmm. To be killed by your own brother with intent. Yeah. Well, did Joseph, did Joseph have any idea what was going to happen to him when he left his father and headed off to find his brothers? No. So a lot of the things that happen to us in life are unexpected. <clears throat> is knowing what is the ultimate destiny of our lives and this world as well help us to stabilize our thinking when serious disruptions take place? Absolutely. We know where yes. things are going to go. Yes. I always struggle as I, I, I read the, the news from time to time. I don't always keep up with everything, not able to keep up with everything that's going on, but I read things and I think, how is this going to work out in the great controversy and get us closer to the second coming? And I'm sure some of the rest of you have done that a lot too. Well, we know that ma no matter what happens to us, we know for sure there is a future wonderful life awaiting God's faithful children. Isn't that ultimate security? Amen. But I know now whom I have believed in, mm -hmm. and I'm persuaded. How beautiful. Well, our lives are filled with choices. Fortunately, many of them do not require any mental effort. They become habits. It is important that we develop habits which are for the best of our health, for our characters, and for the benefit of those around us. So how do we develop habits? Practice. Practice, 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 practice. Yeah, exactly. If you do something often enough in the same sort of way, you will develop a habit. Sometimes that practice isn't intentional. Yeah, that's also true. It's kind of like ruts, you know, <laughs> in your brain. The deeper the rut, the harder it is to get out of it. I, we used to travel around in Africa. I lived in Africa a number of years, and in the rainy season, I've seen even tractors sink down their big old tires right until the, the frame is sitting on the, on the mud. Uh, and I've seen places where they had a little sign up that says, choose your rut carefully, you're going to be in it for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so unfortunately, as we get older, it becomes more and more difficult to change. We all heard that story before. This means that uh, many habits have already been formed. It has been said, and here's a, here's a challenge, men marry women hoping they won't change, but they do. Women marry men hoping they will change, but they don't. <laughs> Think about the implications of that one. The good news for Christians... What are you trying to say about us? <laughs> I'll, I'll let you think about that. And you out there, think about it. The good news for Christians is that God is in the business of changing our lives and personalities for the better, if we're willing to let him. Yes. Amen. But he does not do this against our will. One of God's greatest gifts to humanity is freedom of choice. Mm. So how has your Christianity changed you? Are you easier to live with? Do your family and friends recognize that you're a truly Christian? We're going we're gonna to see some verses on that a little bit later. Um, Think about the incredible story of Paul. Um, I'm going to read just a few verses of that. It's a familiar story. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus? In the meantime, Paul, Saul, it was Saul, of course, at first, and then he became known as Paul. Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord, and you know about that. He, he went off to Damascus, and as Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the sky flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, I want you to notice something. This is, this is important for our reading of other passages in Scripture. What did Jesus say? Who, who was being persecuted according to that statement? Christ. Himself. Yeah. But who was actually being persecuted? Christians. It's God's people. So God thinks of us and regards us as his body, himself. 
And of course, Paul, Saul said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up, go into the city where you'll be told what you must do, and we know the rest of the story. A marvelous story. A general for the enemy's army suddenly joined the Lord's army. And we know anyway. So what changed? He kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. He ate the, the same food. Ate the same food. Yes. Same diet. He, uh, what a change. He, read the, he read the same scriptures. He read, he read the, the same, same scriptures. scriptures. What changed was his picture of God. There you are. Right, right. Yeah. That he was not the boss. He was he someone else. He submitted mm -hmm. to Jesus as Lord. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Man. Some of you may not have been Adventists all your life. And you, it would be good to think back as, as we think about choices. How did you decide to become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? or a Christian of any kind. And for those of you who maybe were born into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, like myself, you might be able to think about a wonderful experience when you help somebody else become a Christian. Well, <clears throat> how could such an incredible change take place? Carrie, I think that's yours. Yes. As Saul yielded himself fully to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he saw the mistakes of his life and recognized the far-reaching claims of the law of God. He who had been a proud Pharisee, confident that he was justified by his good works, now bowed before God with the humility and simplicity of a little child, mm. confessing his own unworthiness and pleading the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. Saul longed to come into full harmony and communion with the Father and the Son, and in the intensity of his desire for pardon and acceptance, he offered up fervent supplications. The prayers of the penitent Pharisee were not in vain. Wow. The penitent inmost, Pharisee almost sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> yes. The inmost thoughts and emotions of his heart were transformed by divine grace, and his nobler faculties were brought into harmony with the eternal purposes of God. Christ and his righteousness became to Saul more than the whole world. And that comes from Acts of the Apostles, page 119, paragraph 2, to page 120, paragraph 1. When we make Christian choices, are we willing to do that in the same spirit that Paul did? Are we willing, as we study, as we think about the life of Christ, and as we want to become more convicted and converted Christians, do we take that kind, same kind of an attitude? Look at a couple places where we talked about God, it talks about God's guidance. Philippians 1, 6, first of all. And so I am sure, this is Paul speaking, of course, and so I am sure that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished on the day of Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? And look at Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. And just before that, as you know, Paul has been berating himself. He says, I want to do what's right, but I can't do it right. And, and, and you know, there's, I, there's some kind of a devil that lives in me, you know, kind of thing. And now he says, but, what? Thanks be to God. Well, such experiences can teach us a lot of things. Are we willing to accept changes as Paul did? Are we willing to accept God's guidance in everything we do? One of the most important things to recognize about human existence is that we are molded by our relationships. God intended for us to have important relationships. Without relationships, even if at times they are not good relationships, we cannot be born. Even after we are born, we depend upon others to care for us until finally we feel that we can start making choices on our own behalf. Clearly, the most important relationships that we have are with other human beings, our families, our friends, even our fellow workers. However, all of these relationships should be trumped by our relationship with God. Is that true in our lives? Let me ask you, is it true in your life? It's important for us to recognize that while others around us affect us, we in turn affect them. And if we want those relationships to be good ones, it is important for us to be the right kind of influence on others. So here's the question. If you choose and you actually practice 
being the best possible influence on those around you, does that reflect back on you? Do, te do people tend to reflect? <coughs> you smile and say good morning, do they tend to smile and say good morning back? Yeah. Normally. Oh, yes. If you come in like a grump, mm -hmm. what happens? <laughs> You don't spread cheer and joy. So how can we individually be the best possible influences, uh, uh, best, best possible kind of influence on those around us? Well, do your family members recognize your influence as positive or negative or some of each? So how do we become more like Jesus each day? fall on my knees and cry and weep and moan that God will just be in me that day and will affect my interactions with everybody I meet. Mm -hmm. It's through prayer and, and, uh, and sometimes not, it's a struggle. Not always, <laughs> not always real easy, is it? No. But if we dare to do it, some people will love us to the point of will want to be dying, and some will hate us with all the passion in the mm -hmm. world. Just one of the verses that's recommended in, in our Bible study guide, May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow more and more and become as great as our love for you. That was Paul's wish for the Philippians. I mean, I'm sorry, the Thessalonians. In our lives, are we willing to accept uh, one another? and to be humble, gentle, and patient? Do we exercise loving tolerance with each other? Are we kind, tender-hearted, willing to forgive? Do we exercise love for others, especially in our families and in our churches? Are we willing to confess our faults to one another and to pray for each other? Is it always true that if we have the right kind of influence on others, that influence will largely be reflected back on us? Well, some of the best examples of change in the Bible are probably exhibited in the lives of the disciples of Jesus. Think of what they went through. I, I, try to, I, I, I think about this often. Imagine these people from their various backgrounds and they come associating with Jesus. And what, what did they think every night when they lay down to go to sleep? What a day. You know, what must they have thought? Even during the ministry of Jesus, they exhibited jealousy, Matthew 20, 20 to 24, and conflict, John 3, 25. They lacked faith, Mark 9, 28 and 29. They even abandoned Jesus, Matthew 26, 56, there in the garden, and betrayed him, Matthew 26, 20. We know about Peter and, 20, and verses 69 to 74. But even when they're behaving their worst, for example, Peter in the courtyard, Matthew 26, 72, people recognize that they had been with Jesus. Jesus. And you know the famous verse, after the resurrection and Pentecost when Peter and John were called to account before the Sanhedrin, even those Jewish leaders recognized that they had been with Jesus. Remember, I love this, remember the, Peter had been called in and, and, and John had been called in and they were been arrested and put in prison and all this kind of stuff and now they're called to, to, uh, to, to speak before the Sanhedrin and Peter gives that resounding sermon to the Jewish leaders. And what, what's their response? They're just sort of, huh? <laughs> what happened to you? Yeah. And then this says, this verse, Acts 4, 13. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. Wow. Could we be companions of Jesus? Well, what kind of men, you know, you might think, well, maybe Jesus went around and he picked just the very best people in, in, in that, among, among the people of Galilee, for example. Charles, I think you're going to tell us something about what kind of people he chose. Jesus chose unlearned. Okay. Fishermen, because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability, um, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. 
in the common walks of life, there is many a man, and I would add woman, yes, and women, patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses, or she, or she <laughs> yes, <laughs> powers which, if called into action, would raise him or her and or her to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his disciples, men and women, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men and women such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men and women took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13, Ellen White's uh, Desire of Ages, page 250. Wow. Chapter, chapter 1. Marvelous comment, yeah. And then there's John 13, 34 and 35. One of the final words that Jesus said to his disciples just before he went out to the garden and was arrested and so forth. Jackie, can you bring us those words? And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Now here, I have a question. When he said, if you have love for one another, how many were included in the one another? More than the twelve. More than the twelve. How many more than the twelve? Us. The whole world. Okay. And this is one of the arguments. Is he talking about just the church members? Or is he talking about the whole world? And think about the implications. Do Christians really stand out? Yeah. That uh, text she just wrote was a Matthew, or, uh, John 13, John 13, 13 34. 34. Mm -hmm. It says a commandment, but it, the first option is a prescription. Mm -hmm. God gives you a prescription rather than a commandment. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that prescription, you're free to reject it or embrace it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I learned that some years ago. This, I, this, uh, what's that? Well, I have a challenge with, I mean, I agree with that completely. My job is giving people prescriptions all day long. I understand. But you, you, they have the opportunity to throw it away, mm -hmm. leave it on the deck like I did when I got the high blood, sh blood pressure <laughs> medication. I just, it may still be there. I haven't <laughs> searched for it. <laughs> so whether I suffered the consequences or not, but anyway, yeah, it's, you're free. Well, could our loving... Uh, uh, could loving our fellow church members, for example, change us so that so completely that everyone would know that we are Christians? Is that possible even in our day? If just the husbands would love their wives and the wives would love their husbands, what just a that, that make? would wow. hu be huge. Mm -hmm. But it's good practice to approach the non-Adventist people out beyond. Well, consider the implications of these two passages from Ellen White. Jackie? I have more. Or Gordon. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Gordon, it was Gordon's, yeah. The most powerful sermon that can be given the unbelieving world in recommendation of our faith is a well-disciplined family, children that are educated to habits of self-denial and self-control and are taught to be courteous, kind, and affectionate will make an impression upon minds that nothing else can. Wow. And another quotation from Ellen White, the home may be plain, but it can always be a place where cheerful words are spoken and kindly deeds are done, where courtesy and love are abiding guests. Uh, both from Ellen White. Hmm. Well, look at Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8. I think we'll have time to read this quickly. Everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. He sets a time for birth, a time for death, a time for planting, a time for pulling up, a time for killing, a time for healing, a time for tearing down, the time for building. He sets a time for sorrow, the time for joy, the time for mourning, the time for dancing. Oh man, I'm, I'm behind time. I don't do much dancing. 
The time for making love and the time for not making love, the time for kissing and the time for not kissing, the time for finding and the time for losing, the time for saving, the time for throwing away, the time for tearing, the time for mending, the time for silence, and the time for talk. He sets the time for love and the time for hate, the time for war and the time for peace. So, what do we gain from all our work? I know heavy burdens and so far, Solomon says. Well, Solomon at that time was a bit insane, so... Yeah. A real depression. So I think God gives us far more freedom th than what is expressed in that statement. Those, th that statement, how many of those things happen to us unexpectedly? All of them. Yeah, I was going to say, what? Most we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So how do we prepare for unexpected events? Staying May under the umbrella of my Redeemer. <laughs> yeah. So we can ask ourselves this question, uh, have we faced any unexpected results or experiences recently and how, how, did, how did that affect us? Were they really important? Did they, did they impact our lives? Um, we think about back to the beginning. Uh, you know about Genesis 1, 14 and 2, 3. Let me just read those verses quickly. Then God commanded let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years, and really religious festivals begin. And then if we go to 2 verse 3, He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day He had completed His creation and stopped working. Well, these verses are speaking about things before sin here on this earth. Even after sin, our lives are controlled or at least influenced by environmental biological, relational, familial, emotional, even political events. Few of any of us would want to be, live banal, unchanging lives. Few of, us would be un, will, few of us will undergo horrendous changes such as happened to Job. But how have we responded to the changes that have happened to us? If we accept what the Bible teaches about future events, uh, up to and including the seven last plagues, we know that we will go through experiences in some way similar to what Job went through. Are we prepared? Think about the influences your parents have had on, your, on you. Can you think of some good influences as well as some perhaps bad influences? How well have you done at passing along only good influences to your children? Well, dealing with young children is often a challenge. I think God gives us children so we can learn about the challenges that he has to face in dealing with us. They have a hard time waiting or understanding <coughs> why waiting is necessary. The authors of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide this time found that since Sabbaths were very special in their family, involving a sundown Sabbath candle ceremony on Friday evenings, Sabbath school, church, often potlucks, times with friends on Sabbath, these Sabbaths formed a kind of weekly clock for their children. When they needed to tell their children that something was maybe three weeks away, they found it was good to say, after three Sabbaths, such and such will happen. This worked well for them and might be something we should try. Jim? Not too commonly known is that the Greek Sabbaton in the New Testament refers not only to the seventh day Sabbath, but also can denote a week. That's in uh, Matthew 28, 1, Luke 18:12. In fact, there is no Greek word for week in the New Testament other than sabbaton. I admit, I was rather excited that our family's substitute of Sabbath for week was biblical. As an important side note, there is at least one translation of the Bible, A. Knoke's Concordant Version, Concordant Version, and a few Christian ministries that do not recognize Sabbaton as referring to the week. This practice may seem inconsequential at first, but it leads to a textual argument for calling Sunday a Sabbath. In keeping with this line of thinking, Matthew 28, 1 consequently uses the expression one of the Sabbaths. Thus, the first day of the week, Sunday, is called a Sabbath. Only context can determine whether Sabbath or a week is intended. Thankfully, just about every recognized English translation renders Sabbaton correctly as weak, as in Matthew 28. For those grammatically inclined, the phrase in question in Matthew 28 literally reads, mean or first sabbaton. But there is no gender agreement between mean, which is feminine, and sabbaton, which is neuter. 
So, therefore, first cannot modify Sabaton, but instead modifies the assumed feminine noun, Hemera, or day. This syntactical construction is similar to, one, in our, to our saying, I'll see you on the fourth. What do we mean? The word day is assumed. Therefore, reading the text as the first day of the week, as opposed to the awkward and ungrammatical, the first day of the Sabbath, is clearly the accurate translation. Back uh, the previous paragraph there, mm -hmm. they talked about the Sabbath. In the Catholic Catechism, they don't call it the Sabbath. They say Sunday is the day that follows the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they don't make it. They, they, but the, yeah. the sac, sa, Sunday sacredness It's the it's, Lord's day that follows the Sabbath, they would say. Well, I'm just reading what they yeah. there. We often think that the Sabbath is a rest that comes at the end of a busy week. But if we remember the process that took place during the first week here on this earth, it was Sabbath who worked all week. I mean, it was God who worked all week long, only Adam and only creating Adam and Eve at the end of the sixth day. So the Sabbath was their first full day. Was God trying to teach us that a time of fellowship with Him and others is our first priority? He makes it clear that work was an essential part of life, but only after they had celebrated their time of fellowship with God. For example, read Exodus 28 to 10 and Genesis 1, 27, 31 and 2, verse 15. In our lesson this week, we have talked about interactions and sometimes dealing with the unexpected. How often do things which are unexpected happen to us, which if we had more carefully evaluated what was going on around us, might have been less unexpected. Think of the story of Joseph. Didn't he have some hint that his brothers weren't real happy about his position? How often do we just pass along to our children some of the bad things we learned from our parents? And considering the unexpected, both Job and Joseph woke up on those fateful mornings and it wasn't, didn't, any, didn't seem any different than any other morning. No one can take away from us, no matter, even in prison, we, ha we have the privilege of prayer and the privilege of, of celebrating the Sabbath. Even in our day, one individual can serve as a kind of transitional person for an entire family. For example, one who in a single generation, and Carrie, did I ask you to read that one? Yeah. Go ahead. Where? One who in Oh, where? I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Yeah. We'll have to, get, you'll have to get our hand out to read the last paragraph. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this privilege we have of coming together and talking about your word, trying to think about the implications of all that you've taught us and, 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 and which you intend for us to learn. We thank you once again that for the life and health which make it possible. We thank you for Jesus. In his name, amen. amen.